you would open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1, we'll continue our discussion there this morning and uh, see how far we get. Hopefully we'll get uh, wrapped up today, but if not, we'll continue next week. Uh, go ahead and start doing your activities. Um, there'll be things in the, the book that <clears throat> we won't necessarily cover, and um, but if you pay close attention, we will probably cover most of it. And um, anyway, you can uh, comb through the book and find the answers in the back for the the back of the chapter or the back of the lesson. We leave that primarily for <clears throat> for you to study the book. I'm not going to go to every scripture, every passage that's there. Um, that's in the book because I hope that you'll read your book. I hope that you'll study during the week. And, uh, you know, there's a there's sort of a sad, um, I guess, reality. And when you get out of, out of school, there, it's like I don't have to do any more homework. I, you know, I don't have to. And so we have that mentality that we don't usually do much work in our workbooks. But uh, hopefully that's not the case with this group. Um, so we'll pick up in chapter 1 here in just a minute. <clears throat> Touch on a few things that we've already talked about, but try to go over those real, real quickly and then get uh, into what we want to talk about today. Let's start our class with a prayer. Father, we're thankful for this day, the Lord's Day. We're thankful for the privilege that we have together to worship. We're thankful for this period of time when we can study. We're thankful that we can come together and not fear the outside forces that would uh, maybe persecute us or, or harm us in some way to keep us from gathering and serving today. We're thankful for that freedom that we have. And as we study the book of Revelation, we look at the difficulties that the first century church had to go through and understand the difficulties that they had to live in. We pray, Father, that we might learn those things that would help us, even in times of great difficulty, to make sure that we're faithful. As we gather this morning, we know there are many who are unable to be with us. We pray that you'll bless them as they are struggling with their health, our recovery from surgery. We pray that uh, you be with them as the doctors work with them to try to restore their health and that they might be back with us before too much longer. We pray for those who've lost loved ones to know the devastation that comes and the, the loneliness and the heartache. And uh, we pray, Father, that you will uh, put your arms around them and help us to, to comfort and encourage in any way that we can. We're thankful for our upcoming activities uh, here at this congregation. We have a, a VBS this week, and we pray that we can support that and uh, engage in some study of your word. We pray, Father, that you'll bless uh, our summer series, which starts this next week. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us uh, in our upcoming Honduras <coughs> mission trip and Many other things we have planned this year, and we pray, Father, you'll bless us as we try to, to get the gospel spread to those around about us. We pray, Father, that you'll forgive us of our sins, help us to overcome those things that cause us to stumble, help us to grow stronger, help us to have a better appreciation of your will, and make sure that that finds its way into our hearts and changes our lives forever. We pray, Father, that you continue to, to bless this congregation, help us to always strive to be united, help us to study thy word, to know it, to be able to stand upon it. We pray, Father, you bless us in the days ahead as we we live in this world which is ever decaying and uh, declining in terms of uh, moral um, decency and things that uh, we see round about us that are headed in the wrong direction. Help us, Father, to make the stands we need to, to take to uh, be in harmony with the teachings of your will. 
We pray, Father, you bless this nation. Help us to head in the right direction. Be with those who protect us. Keep them safe. And be with us today and help us as we worship. That we worship in a manner that's pleasing in thy sight. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we, we talked last week about the book of Revelation. We talked about its author. Uh, we talked about John being the author. We talked about the fact that it was uh, written uh, with understanding. And we look at Revelation today, most of the time you talk about it, if you bring it up uh, in a church setting, there's gasp in the audience. <laughs> what, you know, and, and so... Look at verse 3 real quickly with me. Blessed is he that readeth. Okay, that means there's ability for us to read what is going to be written. And they that hear the words of this prophecy. Now that says that they can read it, they can hear it, and they can keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. This is not going to be something that is, we don't know what this means. We don't, we don't comprehend what's being said. It's going to be understood. It's going to be something that is pertinent to them. The time is at hand. And this is the, the way this is uh, written. There is understanding. It's not this uh, uh, hidden that uh, nobody can comprehend what's going on in the book of Revelation. A lot of symbolism, a lot of uh, figurative language that's talked about, certainly. But as we talked about last week, if you are having to, um, to write <coughs> something uh, to get it out to some, a group of people that's in the midst of some, uh, some civilization that is ongoing and has to understand the difficulties that are going to happen in, in their lives, but in a way that it somewhat protects them, um, from further persecution. And I know that they went through some extreme persecutions, but the idea of it being able to be given to them and they could understand it and could uh, make preparations for what was going to come. Um, I just had a thought and lost it. I'm not sure what. It was, it was going to be good. I can tell you that. But uh, maybe it'll come back to me. But, but the idea here is that... Uh, there are things that, uh, that were going to be written for them. The time was at hand. It was going to be something that was pertinent to them. And um, we just have to, we have to read it with the understanding of what the Scriptures tell us and not try to make more out of it than, than, uh, than is there. In some cases, we always do that. Now, we talked about this last week. John's going to pin this, but who's giving John the, the, the information? It's coming from Jesus Christ himself. And um, if you look at verse uh, 7, um, it talks about, about him. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Jesus is going to reveal himself again. He's going to come again. And uh, there will be those that are aware of what uh, has happened, um, what they've done to him, and, and uh, the, uh, and the, the awareness of who he is. It won't be a secret that, of this is who is coming. And he follows it up by saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. And uh, when we start talking about the Almighty, uh, it excludes everything else. Now, in this world today, there are people who follow religious beliefs, and they have their gods or whatever they've created. But this is the true God. This is Almighty. And, um, you know, when you start talking about the power that's contained there, it, it's, uh, it's uh, unsurpassed. There's no one that's going to come close to that. And so when you have a revelation that's being given to you, uh, from Jesus Christ himself, you should take note. You should perk up and pay attention to what he has to say. And then John adds to that uh, in verse 9. He said, I, John, also am your brother. And uh, he says, look, you, you aren't alone. 
I'm your brother, and I'm pinning this. I'm going, it's going to come to you. This, this, uh, these writings are going to come to you, and uh, I am your brother. I'm in this with you. Now look at what he has to say after that. And companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. There, there's going to be some things that are going to come, but listen. I've been with Jesus. We talked about that last week. He's held, he's touched, he, he's, he's seen him. Uh, he knows who the word of life is that we talked about earlier in the chapter. Um, and, and so he, he's, your, he's your brother. He's with you in these tribulations. He's been through them before. Uh, uh, it's not like that you're, not ex you're experiencing something that no one else has experienced. Yeah. And so as he writes to them, he comforts them by knowing that he is writing as one who has been uh, a part of that. Um, and so he says, I've been in the Isle of uh, Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I've been waiting here for this, and this is what I'm going to do. And then uh, Jesus sort of introduces himself to, to uh, um, John. He said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Behold, there's a great voice and a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And he's telling him to write the things that he is, is going to tell him. And he said, what thou seest, write in a book and send it into the seven churches which are in Asia. And if we were to say, well, okay, who is that? Or what, what does that mean? Who's going to be receiving uh, these writings? Well, he tells us. It's the church, church at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. And so this is who is going to receive these writings. It wasn't written to uh, the church at Antioch. It wasn't written to the church at Jerusalem. It was written to the seven churches of Asia. And um, so this is where the, the, the uh, persecution was going to be the greatest. And um, th there's no way and no, no means that we are going to get into anything other than just scratching a little bit of the surface. Because if we were to be able to get into the historical aspects of the Roman government and who was in power and what they did to Christians, uh, you know, it would, we could start bringing all this together, uh, even understanding some of the, the figurative language that's there. We just don't have the time. And we're just trying to just touch base on a few things. And, um, and so... The continuation, verse 17, uh, some key points that we want to try to touch on this morning. Fear not, this is Jesus talking again, fear not, I am the first and the last. And he continues to tell them, I'm Alpha and Omega. We talked about that last week. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, Omega is the last. I am the beginning, I am the end. I am the first, I am the last. And I am the Almighty. You're talking are receiving writings from John that were directed to him by Jesus Christ. And so the things that he says, when, when do you not pay attention to the words that Jesus said? When do, you, when do you say, okay, well, he's talking, but, you know, that's just a lot of rhetoric. He's just not really saying anything to us. Do you, do you realize the significance here? All scripture is given by inspiration. And the spirit guided men to, for them to write the truth. The scripture is plain on that. But to me, this is a little bit more important. Here is Jesus himself speaking to John through the spirit, of course. But he's speaking to John and saying, this is what I want you to write down. And he's, he's talking about some significant things. He's talking to them about who he is. And that he has a power over all things. And that he can control all things. And they need to pay attention to what he's saying. And uh, we're, this is going to be borne out as we go on. Again in verse 18. I am he that liveth. I'm alive today. And I was dead. And behold I am alive forevermore. Now what's the significance of that? If we're going to be like Christ, if we're going to render obedience to the teachings of the gospel, we were dead in our sin and trespasses. We were going to be born again. Now, what happens to us physically? What's going to happen to us? 
we're going to all die, right? These people were going to die. They might have died some horrific deaths. They may have um, suffered extreme persecutions. But did not Jesus when he was here upon the earth? I don't know how much more cruelty you can inflict on a body than what was inflicted on Jesus Christ. And yet he is, in that affliction, he died. But what does he say? He said, I'm alive forevermore. Now, if we follow Jesus and we're uh, obedient to his, his will and do what he tells us to do, we're going to live forevermore. Now, that's the message here to these Christians. I was dead. I died. But now I'm alive forevermore. And so you have someone that, that has tasted death. You have someone who was persecuted. And you have someone who's alive forevermore. And have the keys of hell and death. I have the keys. If you were to get thrown into something that you couldn't see the way out of, guess what? Jesus has the keys to let you out. And so you're, you're dealing with someone who, though you're going to go through some tremendous difficulties in your lives and persecution, you have someone who ultimately can open the doors and let you out, and you'll have your freedom. So these words are, are very important uh, for those who are going to be persecuted during the times of the, writing, uh, the, the Roman government. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, the things which shall be hereafter. And he goes and starts talking about the mystery of the seven stars, and we won't get into that. Like I said, we just do not have time to cover all that and try to address every aspect of, of the book of Romans. I mean, uh, Revelation. But let's look at, uh, sort of glance through chapter 2 and chapter 3. I want to pick up on some things here that get us an understanding. He's writing to the seven churches. He addresses each one separately. And he tells John what to write into each church. He's, he writes first to the church at Ephesus. And uh, he says, uh, you know, I know your works, verse 2. I know your labors, your patience. Uh, I know how that you can't bear that which is evil. He starts telling them some things that uh, he, he knows what they are doing. He knows about them. Uh, God knows all. Jesus Christ, his son, knows all. And these things are evidenced by the way that they conduct themselves as the church at Ephesus. Um, and then he gets to verse 4 and he says, Nevertheless, I have someone against you because you've left your first love. Now, I, I want to go ahead and jump forward just a little bit, and we'll try to touch on this as we go through. But there are two things that are um, brought forth in the, what Jesus has to say to the churches. Now, they may not be uh, always worded exactly the same way, but uh, you see the theme sort of going throughout. Now, <clears throat> so let me say, figure out how to say this. We talked about it last week a little bit. This book was written to the seven churches of Asia. It was written to the things that must shortly come to pass. But, Every time we hear God speak to the Old Testament characters, those people that were before the flood, uh, during the time of Moses, during the time of uh, the, the kings of Israel, throughout the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament times, um, God's consistent in what he does. And when he talks about things that are his, his principles, his laws, what he expects from us, those are universal. It's not like you go back and say, well, God uh, wanted people to live a certain way. Um, and I'm not talking about following the law of Moses and, and those kind of things. But what I'm talking about is uh, God's ways are consistent. We don't have a God of the Old Testament that is foreign from the God of the New Testament. We have consistent uh, characteristics and principles and laws in which he wants to govern our lives. And so, although this was written 
to these churches in Asia that were going to be dealing with the difficulties. There's always the principles of God and the teachings of God that are applicable for us today. We could take what's being said and we can say, even though that was written for them, these is, this is how God wants us to, to live and he addresses things in our lives. And so we can gather things from it and gain insight into how he would want us to conduct ourselves at the church at Maysville, for example. We could look at these writings to the seven churches of Asia and say, well, you know, that could be applicable here. And we can learn from it. We can, we can grow because of it. So I want that to be clear. Although we talk specifically about the seven churches of Asia, the principles of God, the teachings of God are consistent such when we read of what he has to say and how they should be conducting themselves, those are applicable for us today as the body of Christ uh, in the time in which we live. So I hope we understand that because the Bible is consistent with that. It's not like uh, we have a God of Moses and a God of Jacob and a God of the New Testament church, and they're all different. It's totally the same. We need to understand that. So I, I set that as a background for what he's beginning to say here. The two things that I want to bring out that are consistent with each one of these is the fact that Jesus says um, in this passages, in these passages, number one, look at verse seven. He that hath an ear, do what? Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And you're going to find that consistently throughout the writings here in chapter 2 and chapter 3 as he writes to the seven churches. Let him that hath an ear hear what is being written to the churches. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. There's uh, some sort of... Uh, chastisement that takes place in writings uh, uh, as God would write to the Israelites as, as uh, even in the New Testament times Jesus would make uh, uh, statements concerning he that hath an ear let him hear what does that statement say to us and we I live in, a, in, in, a, in this, this world we live in today. We're in this audience. If I were saying to you, he that hath an ear, let him hear, what does that mean? Pay attention. I'm telling you something you better pay attention to. Let me tell you something. You know that the old analogy, analogy, <coughs> analogy, analogy of the frog that's in the pot of water and it's, you know, it feels cool and it's okay, but the stove is slowly turned up and the frog basically sits there until it cooks because he doesn't recognize the change in temperature because it's so gradual. By the time he realizes that it's getting too hot, he's going to cook, he's already cooked. I am convinced because of just things that happen in my life and you, you have to make a decision about yourself. I am convinced there are things that we hear all the time. And if you were to be pressed on that and you say, well, is that really right? And you would say, yeah, that's truthful. But the second part of that is what we're missing. We have ears to hear, but we're not listening. There are people in the church today who can tell you if something is right or wrong according to what the Scripture says, but they're not paying attention because they're not doing anything to affect their lives by what they're hearing. They've tuned it out. We can do that. We, we do it all the time. We, we talk about, jokingly, you know, used to be uh, the newspaper. 
Anybody know what a newspaper is anymore? Used to be the husband reading the newspaper, you know, after dinner or something, the television's on, and, and the wife says, uh, something, 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 and uh, she says, did you hear a word I said? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we know the answer to that. Did, did he hear a word she said? Yes, yeah, she was talking. He heard some, some, some things being said, but did he pay attention? Did he comprehend? Did he really listen to what was being said? No. And so you have that, uh, that uh, bantering back and forth. Well, well, tell me what I said then. Uh, buh, buh, buh. Folks, I'm convinced that if you look at the seven churches of Asia, you're going to find them just as true as if they were in the world today. And what we're going to find in all these cases, as Jesus writes to them, is an indication that they're, they're not listening. They're not listening. Here's a church that, that was doing good things. I mean, you, you, you're, uh, you're, I know your works, your labor, and your, your, and your patience, and how thou canst not bear or eat things that are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and found them to be false. You're doing some good things but you've left your first love. And we've, we've put up those defenses and we've said, you're not coming in here, you're not going to teach us false doctrine. But in the midst of all the things that they'd done and they were doing good works, what's this claim against them? You've left your first love. You're just not as dedicated as you were. Now, we have to ask ourselves those questions. Am I as dedicated as I once was? Now, here's why it's significant. You're going to be persecuted. There's not, it's not one of, one of those things where, this, you know, may something may come your way, you might have to watch out for it. You are going to be persecuted. How are you going to stand if you don't have the love of God that you have to have? The Almighty can be writing to you and saying, I, I have all power and I've overcome death and I have keys to, to, to hell and, and to death. But if we're not paying attention, if we're not taking it in and making the changes in our lives and we're not the people we need to be, you're not going to escape these persecutions. You're not going to survive them. Now, I'm not talking about physically. Because obviously some of these did not make it past uh, the physical persecutions. We're talking beyond that. That's why Jesus is writing the way he's writing. I'm the, I'm the first and the last. I'm the Almighty. I have overcome death. Because we are going to have to deal with the consequences in terms of the second death. How are we going to live? And if we don't take care of things now, we're not going to make it. Pay attention. If you have ears, you better be listening. The churches were told this. You think that's being said to us today? To the church at Maysville, let him that hath ears hear what the Spirit says. And I'm afraid that we get into Bible classes and we, we come we get into the worship service where we have the word preached into us. And it's like, well, I know he, he had, well, what would he talk about today? What, what was that? I, I caught part of it. But I really don't remember what he had to say. Our ears are hearing words but we're not paying attention. And so the message to every church is if you have ears, you better be listening to what the Spirit says to the churches. That's point number one. Number two is also found in verse seven. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcometh, what's going to happen? Yeah. 
in this particular verse, I will give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You better be paying attention. You better listen to what's being said. Comprehend it. Take it in. Make it change your lives. Live according to what God's will is telling you to do. That would, in this case, to the church at Ephesus, renew their first love. To get back to your, your, your love and dedication to God. Oh, they're, they're going through the motions. They're doing the right kind of things but they've left their first love. And so, listen to what the Spirit says, and if you listen and you understand and you implement what God has told you, and you take care of these things that are, are, are remiss or missing in your lives, you put yourself in the right relationship to God, listen, you're going to be persecuted. You've got to be in the right frame of mind. You've got to be aligned with God if you're going to be able to come out of the end of this and to have your eternal life intact. Because what happens when we get persecuted? If you face something and you continue to be uh, pushed away as it were. Um, you ever gone out and passed, try to pass out uh, tracts or invitations to come to church in the neighborhood and you come to a house with a vicious dog? Now most of you just open the gate, walk right up to the front door and you say, well, I'll just get some, some stitches if he tears me up. No, I don't think you do that. You'll probably say, well, you know, I went to that house I, I approached it, I, I saw what it looked like was going to be a very life-threatening situation, and I, I sort of moved on to the next house. Maybe you stuck something in the gate or something that I hoped people would find. When we face persecution, and it's hard, what's the tendency to do? You try to survive. You try to escape the persecution. You, you will hide, you will back down, you will go in a different direction because that persecution, it's painful. And so this persecution is going to come. What's it going to do to us? What's it going to, uh, what, what, how our lives are going to be changed? And, and we can talk about that. We can say, yeah, I, I think I'll remain faithful. What happens if your kids are being drug out in the streets in front of you beaten beheaded because people don't care they, they the, the Jews the Christians they're dogs of society we just put, put them to bed you know we just we'll kill them their kids kids don't mean anything when you realize the heart it heartedness of the Roman leaders and the Roman government and what they were capable of doing then you realize what some of these people are going to do. If you're not tied in with God, if you aren't focused on who you are and what you're supposed to be about how easy it is to succumb to persecution and to run away from it, to hide to denounce that, that Christ is the Savior, that he's bought you with the price. These are things that are going to be extremely difficult. And so two things. One, listen to what I'm telling you. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And secondly, if you're faithful, if you're able to overcome, there's great blessings. But you've got to be able to overcome. That's the point. Not going to be easy. And not, they're not trying to, in this, um, say that there's not going to be persecution. Uh, we're going to see later on in some of the passages that uh, it's going to be for a time and, and it's going to just be for a quick season. It's going to go away, but you're going to have to endure it.
level of faithfulness by these people outlined in this book. It said, if you are faithful, even unto death, you'll be rewarded, or you'll get this, or you'll get that. And if you carry that statement to its end, well, the, the idea is, is if you're not faithful, then you won't be rewarded. Yep. And, and the burden that was placed on them, or the level of performance, and then you apply that to what we do today. We, we have it, I think, too easy to where even our, our simple, routine failures, we think, well, that's just one more failure and a pile of failures, and God will be okay with that. But if you read Revelation, he was not okay with that. Under huge pressure, he expected these people to remain faithful. And, and I think that we have, um, we don't appreciate the burden that really is on us, even though we don't feel it every day. Absolutely. And, that, and that's why when, when he says here, and in other passages, he that hath ears. I mean, you know, you, that statement just seems ludicrous, right? Well, who doesn't have ears? Well, I mean, we know some people that can't hear. There are people who have physically have ears, but they can't hear. We know that. But how many times was that discussed? He that hath ears, do what? You better listen to what's going on and pay attention. Use those ears for a purpose. That statement is, is consistent throughout New Testament teachings. Jesus said it on a number of occasions. He sa says it here. If you've got ears, you better be listening. Well, th that's a message for us today, right? I'm over here in the world that I live in and I don't have a government breathing down my neck. I don't have him pulling me out of my houses and beating me. And yet, how do we compare in dedication to these Christians? I mean, asks, what will be the end of us compared to people who are expected to perform against yeah. huge tasks? Um, It's it, it's a message. I mean, I, I mean that that's why I want to talk about this morning. It, here's se seven churches that are going to be facing dire persecutions, and Jesus says you better pay attention to what I'm saying. And what's going to re be required of you is that you overcome. You've got to overcome, regardless of what happens to you. You got to overcome. <laughs> and and. If you've never uh, read Fox's Book of Martyrs or some other historical writing that talks about some of the persecutions that the early church went through, uh, you, you need to read it or at least get a feel for it. Uh, maybe somehow you could get a, a synopsis of it. But these were very difficult times. I mean, could you imagine somebody knocking on your door this afternoon and saying, you know, we're here from the government, we understand that you're following this Christ and you're claiming to be one of his followers? And you say, yes. And it, okay, well, you know, they drag you out and they, you know, they start beating you or they do something to you that's just unthinkable. We don't have that. So, as Steve makes a valid point if we don't have that then why is it that we struggle and can't do what we need to do for God because we're not being persecuted like that are we not required to be faithful in all things and so here's the message that's each to each one of them and so that's the writing to the church at uh, Ephesus, hear what's to, to be said by the Spirit to the churches and overcome. That's the message. Okay, let's go down to, to the second church in Sardis. Um, church in, uh, I mean Smyrna. Verse 8. The angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things, uh, say, saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive again. I know your works, uh, tribulations and poverty uh, but thou art rich and I know the blasphemy of them which say that they are Jews and are not but are, are the synagogue of Satan fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer 
Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Here it is again. Verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear that the Spirit saith to the churches, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. What about the first death? He didn't say that. He didn't say you wouldn't be harmed in the first death. But he says if you're faithful, you will not be harmed in the second death. And so, the same message. You, and, and in verse 10, um, the idea that we see there is tribulation 10 days. There's going to be a period, there's a, there's a period uh, of tribulation. And he uses the, the term 10 days. Um, signifying that it would have a, a finite period. Uh, but it's going to be tough. And again, the same message, to hear and overcome. The church in the Pergamos, um, I know your works, uh, I know where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and uh, thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Uh, even in those days when Antipas, Antipas, I mean, was my faithful martyr, uh, faithful witness, uh, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. And he says, I have a few things against you that you hold to the doctrine of Balaam. You have false doctrine that you're holding on to. You've got to get rid of it. Um, and he tells him to repent, verse 16. And then verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden man, and will give him a, a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth it. You see the consistency here of all the churches? The church at Ty, uh, Thyatira, verse 18. These things write, saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine uh, fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and uh, patience and, uh, and, uh, and the, the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which called herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And um, he goes on and says I'll kill her children with death verse 23 um, but I say this unto the rest of Thyatira, um, that uh, goes on to say in verse 25, but that uh, which ye have already held, hold fast till I come. And verse 26, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. All right? Church at, Sm at Sardis, uh, chapter 3. Of these things saith he that, he that hath the seven spirits of God. Uh, be watchful, strengthen the things which remain, they be re that, that are ready to die. And I have found thy works, uh, I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Uh, again, verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And um, it just goes on and on. Philadelphia. And each one of these churches, uh, Laodicea a little bit later on. You're lukewarm. You're lukewarm. Are we a church on fire? How would you answer that? Are we a church that is, uh, I, I would say we're, we're uh, typical. We're doing some of the right things. I mean, we're, we're trying to, we'll try to defend false teaching. We'll try to help those in the community. We try to take care of those that we know about. Uh, we try to make sure we teach the right things. So and so, were we a church on fire? I was talking to somebody yesterday. They were asking about Maysville. They were from another congregation. And I said, we're, you know, I said, how's it going at Maysville? I said, well, you know. What do you say? About like it always is? 
You, you, you come in here. Where, how many people are going to have for services this morning? Close to 300, I'd, I'd venture to say, right? How many are we going to have tonight? Less than half? Probably a good guess. So we have 300. We may have 150 or maybe even less than that tonight. Are we a church on fire? He that hath ears to hear better be listening. Next week we will uh, try to do the activities at the back of the book, so please work on that.